Welcome. I'm Stephen Winnick of the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. For many years, we have presented the Homegrown Concert Series, featuring the best in folk music and dance from around the world. In the year 2020, because of the global pandemic, we shifted to producing an online video concert series, which we call Homegrown at Home. So 2021 was our second year of Homegrown at Home concerts, and it's now early 2022, and we're doing interviews with the artists who performed in that series. And we were very honored in that series to have a group from New England called Windborn. Um, and Windborn is a great harmony singing group, and uh, we're gonna have a brief conversation with them now, and I'm gonna ask them each to uh, introduce themselves by name. All right, my name is Jeremy Carter Gordon. Uh, I am originally from Concord, Massachusetts and now live in Somerville. And uh, we're really excited to be here today. Thanks for having us. I'm Lauren Drunig. Um, I grew up in Vermont and I also now live in Somerville, Massachusetts. I'm Lynn Rowan and I grew up right near Lauren in Southern Vermont. And I now live with my husband, Will, in Goshen, Massachusetts. I'm Will Rowan. I grew up in southern New Hampshire, and I now also live in Goshen, Massachusetts. Excellent. So it sounds like all of you have uh, deep New England roots. Um, so let's talk about some of your early formative experiences uh, in the, the kind of music communities that you find in New England. Um, whoever, again, like this is sort of informal, whoever can chime in um, in these beginning questions. So yeah. Who wants to go? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I can speak to that. So mm -hmm. we all sort of grew up um, in various ways connected to uh, folk music and dance communities in New England. Um, things like shape note singing um, parties that happened in my family's living room, um, which is the way that uh, I remember meeting Will back when we were kids. And um, we all were involved uh, in some way or another with uh, traditional dance groups like Morris teams um, and other uh, contra dancing, that sort of uh, participatory communities that that really bring people into engaging with with traditional arts. Um, and then when we were teenagers, we all went to a uh, singing camp with Village Harmony, which uh, brings music teachers from different parts of the world uh, to teach the the traditions that they've been steeped in um, and share those those traditions with teenagers and adults. Um, and we sort of expanded our our love of traditional music to. Uh, uh, countries and cultures outside of the U.S., uh, largely through the influence of Village Harmony. Mm -hmm. So, talk a little, a bit about Village Harmony and how that works. Like who, uh, who, who attends and um, and when it occurs and and where and all of that great stuff. Someone else want to jump in? I mean, I can keep talking, but yeah, whichever yeah. of you wants to. Yeah. Um, so, Village Harmony. Um, the way we first encountered it was through its uh, teen summer camp programs. Um, and they're sort of structured on a touring basis where you get together in sort of a retreat center somewhere in New England, usually. And uh, there's a you have a few different teachers uh, that get together for the camp um, and you rehearse for a week and then you go on a tour around. It, it was often sort of in in New England. Um, and uh, and we would give a concert in sort of a, a village church um, or a, a community hall or some sort of other community space and then uh, would be put up uh, by people in the community uh, who did homestays. Um, and in terms of the, the musical repertoire, it was really varied. Um, there was certainly a lot of a lot of music that was sort of based in the US. There were some great teachers of Sort of Appalachian music, shape note singing, um, but there are also teachers who would come from South Africa, from the Republic of Georgia, from Bulgaria. Um, we worked with a teacher from Russia at one point, um, and and uh, there were also international programs that happened. Sort of as you got older, um, the 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 opportunity was given to you to go to these. Uh, programs in places like Corsica and Bulgaria, the Republic of Georgia, South Africa. Um, and those were sort of more of an immersive experience, going to the place and working with traditional musicians and and uh, dancers in that space. 
Lynn and I went to Bulgaria in 2003. Uh, Lauren went to Corsica. Um, I forget the year, but uh, Lynn and I also went to Corsica soon after that. Um, and it was really, it was really a, a place where we got uh, invested in singing in harmony and singing in groups um, and, and really opened our ears um, and the way we, we think about music. Cool. Yeah. One thing that's interesting is that um, sort of North American traditional folk music has a strong uh, monophonic strain and like the ballad singing and that kind of thing. But there's also polyphonic traditions like you've mentioned shape note singing. Um, but Village Harmony seems to really broaden that out and and look for harmonic traditions elsewhere as well. Um, so so how did that affect your perception of traditional folk music being in that, in that kind of environment. I mean, yeah, usually... when we... go ahead then. Well, I was just, yeah. Um, I mean, I think it had a huge impact on, on us as singers. And I think also um, the types of folk singing that we grew up doing um, locally in New England, even outside of Village Harmony also had a lot more harmony than maybe um, everyone else's experience. I think we did a lot of, you know, pub singing and were exposed um, to, you know, hippie church choirs singing that Lauren and I did as we were kids and, you know, Tony Barand and Peter and Mary Alice Amadon and Noel Sing Me Clear, um, you know, who Lauren's dad is a part of. Right. That there's just there was a lot of harmony singing and shape note like Lauren mentioned and so um, I think it was very natural to us to have harmony be part of all kinds of singing and um, village harmony didn't feel that different in that way I think I, I mean at least for me but I, I think you know for Lauren as well harmony singing wasn't new um, and definitely when we you know were singing together at first when when Windborn started it was Lauren and Will and I and it was you know, we were just teenagers when we first started. It was an excuse to keep singing songs we learned from camp. But as we got older and started trying to do some of our own things and make our own arrangements of things, and Jeremy joined us. And I think as we write our own arrangements now, you can definitely hear some of the influences of um, the, the music we grew up singing and some of those pub sings, but also a lot of the music we learned through Village Harmony and music and rhythms and harmonies from other cultures. Um, so I think those influences sometimes, you know, harmonies in some seconds or, you know, some rhythms uh, in, you know, not not your average meter creep into right. some of our arrangements for sure. Right. Very interesting too, that there's kind of a regional thing going on in the sense that, um, you know, that, that monophonic ballad tradition is very, it, it does exist in New England, of course, but it's also very prevalent in, in Appalachia. And there's, when people think of American folk music, I guess they tend to think Southern as opposed to Northern. Um, so how does that affect um, your approach? Just the, the, the fact of your, of your regionality in, in New England, do you think? Yeah, it's, it's interesting the, the sort of the question of regionality, because I think one of the peculiarities of the folk community that we all grew up in is it's, uh, it's really Anglophile. Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of the the folk traditions that were being done, um, you know, centered around uh, the Country Dance and Song Society, um, which started off, of course, as the Country Dance and Song Society of America, being the the American branch of the, an English folk organization. Um, and so the communities that we were in, it was just as common to find, um, you know, English pub songs as it was to find any kind of, you know, Appalachian ballad or something like that. Um, and I think perhaps, you know, perhaps some of that was connected to uh, being more closely tied with these, with these uh, New England, uh, it says it right in the name, these New England traditions of, yeah. of, the, of the shape note singing and, and things like that, um, that, you know, had those roots again in, in New England, but, you know, our parents' generation, uh, really, when when all uh, everyone in England was getting excited about these American, Southern American singers, and was uh, you know trying to imitate them in the folk clubs, all of our parents were learning Morris dancing and uh, imitating the Watersons and the Copper family and those groups. So it's um, 
you know, we, we certainly did also grow up with, with um, songs that feel a little bit more regional. And a lot of the times when, when we talk about Winborn's uh, inspirations and, and Winborn's early influences, I really think of it as these like three different channels. Um, you have, you know, on one side, you have this channel of um, participatory uh, improvisational harmony that is really these like pub pub songs that maybe is a, mm -hmm. a little bit more of an English uh, background. Um, we have something that is sort of the song repertoire that that we that we got, which is a lot of these things from the folk singers who are around us in our community that did do a lot of these American songs. Um, but very few of them in our particular community were uh, without harmony, or if they if they were without harmony, they certainly had harmony uh, in in instrumentation, um, and and then this sort of third third aspect, which is village harmony, and that really shaping our curiosity and and abilities and skills around how to learn music that's radically different than the music that we are accustomed to, mm -hmm. um, how to listen to things. Uh, and and understand about vocal styles. And so you have sort of the repertoire coming from one place, the improvisation and arranging and crafting of of a piece. And then you have this like curiosity and ability to engage with different kinds of music. And I think that's sort of the intersection that we really find ourselves in now. And that's been a process like over time, you know, our different albums reflect different facets of that. Um, and uh, Sure. Yeah, but that melding is is sort of where we're <laughs> where we're yeah. gotten to. Really interesting. Well, you you so you've mentioned already in this interview two people who I think should probably be acknowledged. Well, one was a family. You mentioned the Watersons, and of course, uh, Norma passed away just uh, in the past few days. Um, and it's something I think that sort of rocked the folk world on both sides of the uh, of the Atlantic. Um, and you also mentioned Tony Barrand, um, who. I know was huge in your musical lives, was huge in our musical lives. He's a, in our, here at the library. He donated yeah. his large collection of uh, Morris dance uh, documentation to us. And so we're all sort of processing that as well. Um, if you could talk a little about, I guess, particularly Tony's influence, because I know that was very important to, to some of you, I guess, particularly probably Lauren, because your dad was in a band with Tony for so many years. Yeah, I mean, Tony, it's sort of hard to overstate the influence that that Tony Barron had on on my life and, and really all of our lives. I think, um, I mean, especially in thinking about about him and his influence in the past week, it's, you know, we see him everywhere in our music. Yeah. Um, I mean, my family moved to New England to in, in the 70s to sort of be near Tony and, and be part of of that um, folk revival, and and my dad, you know, ended up singing with Noel Sing We Clear for forty years, and so like for me, Noel and Tony like is the voice of Christmas, um, and that yeah. that is so much has, has so shaped my my um, sense of celebration and community around the holidays. But in just in thinking about Windborn, you know, Tony was such a storyteller, both both in in speaking and in his in his singing, and I think that that has really um, shaped the way we approach music. And and there's you know we have so many of of what I think of as Tony moments when we're rehearsing of of a, a certain you know rhythmic variation or a little inflection on a vowel or or a little like side comment um, that that feels so characteristically um, him, and and that's that's really been we've been thinking about that a lot, a lot lately. And I just, yeah, I, I want to add one, one other mm -hmm. sort of person to, to hold up. That's been a, a huge influence on us, which is who also passed away recently, which is Larry Gordon, the founder of yes. Village Harmony passed away in November. So we're, the folk world is definitely reeling from a lot of huge losses, a lot of real icons um, that, you know, we, we want to do our best to carry their legacy forward. Um, and and we, we hope that our, our music is an, an honor to their memory. Well, I think all of them would be proud of what Winborn is doing. Uh, and um, and I'm sure Tony told you that at some point before, before he went. So, um, so it's wonderful to have you continuing these legacies that you've inherited from such great people. 
Um, so talking about the sort of history of your group, you sort of alluded to starting out, you know, as smaller groups and ultimately adding Jeremy and becoming the full quartet. But how did how did that come together over the years? Well, um, so back when we were sort of just at the end of high school, um, uh, at some point, I think it was basically what happened was Lauren went off to Corsica with Village Harmony and she came back and she wanted to teach us a bunch of songs that she'd learned there. Um, this was, she wanted to teach, uh, teach Lynn and me though, them. And so we, we were learning some songs that she'd learned there and, and we, you know, we were like trying to think of other songs that we, that we loved singing from camps. Um, and we sort of built up kind of a, a little repertoire of songs that we wanted to do. And we decided we were going, going to put on a concert. Um, and we arranged with a tea shop in Brattleboro, Vermont, uh, to, to do a concert. And, uh, we came up with the name Windborn, which was sort of, sort of like, that seemed like the, the choice we wanted to make at that particular moment. Um, we saw it written written somewhere, and we were like, "That that would make a good name for for this <laughs> band," um, and uh, and so we gave a little a little concert. We were you know 18, 18 19, something like that, um, and uh, and you know it was mostly attended by our high school friends and parents, um, and and sort of we gave a little concert, and it was like, okay, fine, um, and sort of. Over the course of of sort of our time in college, um, we sort of did we did an occasional show here and there. Um, the identity of the group was very much just like sort of whatever the three of us wanted to wanted to do, wanted to sing. Um, there wasn't a there wasn't a lot of like writing writing something new at first, um, but sort of as the as the group evolved at some point we decided we wanted to well it was actually it was when it was lauren had had gone had moved away for a while and when she came back to the brattleboro area um we were sort of able to see each other more regularly and sort of rehearse um and and so we decided to we decided to make a cd um the three of us and we sort of started doing some more concerts um and uh, and we at, that was the point that we sort of we started dipping our toes into sort of doing group arrangements a little bit, um, and sort of concurrently to all this, as we were part of another group um, called Renewal, which was a self-organized choir. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was all people who had been to Village Harmony camps and were mostly um, in college or around that age and decided to get together in January because most of us had some time off in January between semesters. And we would get together and we would teach each other songs and then we would go on a small tour. And that happened for quite a few years. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to remember if it was something something like 10 years. Um, so past the point where any of us were in college, past the point <laughs> where any of us really had the time to be doing this anymore. Um, and that was, that was, it was in that group that we, uh, that we sort of most, that we started really spending time with Jeremy, um, and singing with him. And then at a certain point, everybody in renewal said, okay, we really can't do this anymore. So, so we're done. We're not going to do it anymore. And, uh, Lynn and Lauren and I sort of talked to each other and were like, well, we don't actually want to not do this anymore <laughs> we we could we could take uh take the time to do a little tour here and there's a whole bunch of people in new england who are sort of used to hearing a concert around this time so uh so why don't we just do that why don't we just organize a tour for windborne um and i can't remember exactly where the idea of inviting jeremy to join us on that tour came from does anybody else? Lauren. Came from Lauren. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren brought me into the group and uh, then I never left. So that's how we ended up where we are today. Well, I mean, the it, it's interesting because, because 
like it, it was sort of like a we initially thought of it as like a, we were inviting Jeremy along for this tour. It was going to be like Windborn with special guest Jeremy. <laughs> we in fact we floated the idea of having a couple more a couple more guests from Renewal join us for the tour, but Jeremy was the only one who uh, who could do it. And uh, we sort of you know we went on this tour, which was like a week or something like that. Um, and right at the end or right after the end of that tour, um, while Lauren was uh, getting on the plane to to go back to where she was living in Arizona at the time, um, Jeremy uh, found this link to the American Music Abroad program, um, which was accepting applications like the next day. And um, and it's a it's a program where where uh, the state department sends groups out to do diplomatic tours in various places around the world um and so jeremy sent us this link and and we thought well like, wow that would be crazy you know a uh, a quartet that's been together for a week long tour <laughs> you know where we would apply to to this program um but we only had a day and so we emailed them and they said yeah you can take the weekend because the the due date was a friday um and so so we you know we we spent a crazy weekend teleconferencing and writing all these applications and trying to figure out what videos we could submit um and you know we we put together this application and we sent it off and we were very surprised when they invited us to audition and even even more surprised when after we auditioned, they accepted us. And it was that tour through Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan and Angola that really sort of, uh, it felt like it was banned boot camp because we really had, we had to be completely on our game. We had to be ready to, to do whatever, wherever, whenever, um, roll off a bus in the middle of the, of the step in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> in freezing temperatures and and run into a, a high school gymnasium and give a little performance and and teach a song and then run back onto the bus and <laughs> um but it was kind of amazing too because it was a tour that that we didn't have to organize we didn't have to think about the logistics of it um we just had to focus on the music and on on you know sort of our creative part of it on our artistic part of it right. so so we uh so we were it was really an opportunity to really hone our craft and and, and hone our group sound um and get to to put it in front of a lot of people um and sort of test it in front of audience all sorts of audiences that we you know we never would have expected to be in front of yeah it sounds like a an absolutely amazing experience um so you had mentioned that uh early on uh Lauren brought to you some Corsican songs and you were singing those and then you were doing uh, other material from other countries as well. Was the State Department tour, I mean, since it's American music abroad, were, did you all move your repertoire more toward American songs or did you continue sort of a broad eclectic group of songs? Yeah, that was one yeah, of the things that was so funny about it is that we we were going to all these different places, but we were supposed to be singing American music. And <laughs> when we were putting together the application, we had to sort of go back to our pre-Village Harmony roots and think about some of the music we've grown up singing because we were supposed to present, you know, an example concert of all American music. Um, so that was what part of what was so funny is because up until then, yeah, we were sort of used to doing the Village Harmony grab bag of music <laughs> from all over the place. But for this tour, we basically spent a summer and came up with a whole bunch of songs that various of us had grown up with um, that were American in some way and um, wrote a bunch of our own arrangements. And this was also part of what sort of really cemented us into a, a quartet was suddenly we had a whole bunch of new repertoire that we developed for this tour. And that's actually where our album Lay Around That Shack came, came out of. So talk about the process of transforming that that concert repertoire from a, from a State Department tour into uh, an album project? Yeah, well, even going back before uh, the State Department tour, I was just thinking, as, as Will was describing, the early days of Windborn, thinking about the transition um, of, of our identity from a trio into a quartet. Um, 
part of the reason that it really worked as a trio in the beginning is that a lot of the singing traditions that we'd learned at Village Harmony come from um, from trio singing traditions like Georgian mm -hmm. music and Corsican music. A lot of that is sung traditionally in three parts. So it right. really worked as a trio. And, you know, there's there's also a, a big tradition of, of doubling parts. So it totally also can work as a larger group. But as we um, developed um, the music for the American Music Abroad Tour and, and we're working with four voices, we could sort of expand the the dynamic of, of what we could do. And um, yeah, coming back from that, we were really excited about having a, a fourth voice, this this sort of full range and um, and taking that and, and seeing where we could go with that and, and really uh, finding exploring like who we are as arrangers, um, not just in American music, but also like bringing in all of those influences from other traditions. So when we got back from the tour, some of the songs had sort of solidified over the course of of touring as as songs do. And um, we we you know picked up a, a couple of more songs to to add to the album and and really like let those other influences seep their way in. And I think that 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 process has only continued more and more as as we've grown as musicians. Mm -hmm. And so, and so yeah, sorry, go on. I just wanted to sort of also draw attention to one of the things that I think was a was a real shift during that time is that the the very first tour that we did as a trio and sort of much of or a good chunk of the repertoire that we did on the State Department tour with American Music Abroad, really what that was, was uh, Lynn and Lauren and Will had trio arrangements of pieces. And then I came in and sort of improvised a bass line to it, <laughs> yeah. which more or less worked because that's what I like doing anyway. And they sort of, you know, they made fun of me because I would do a different thing each time. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was, that was, how that initial sort of transformation happened was really just you know sticking something under what was already going on and as we started moving you know a little bit on that first album when we were doing the album process and came back and we're developing more more songs um and then more and more as as we've gone on certainly with our our uh, latest album um which is uh song of the times and then the upcoming yeah. album it's moved into a much more of this like collaborative uh, process of arranging songs that that is pretty um, unique. I mean, not 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 totally unique, but it, it, it comes up with some pretty unique stuff, which is uh, a fairly improv improvisational um, method where we just stick the melody on someone's voice. And <laughs> sometimes we, we experiment at who's who's going to do that. And we try out a couple different options. And everyone else gets to play around and try out different chords and try out different notes and different harmony lines. And then after the a process of recording and listening and um, the listening being a really uh, vital part of that, we sort of whittle away and, and take away the parts that don't feel like they quite work. And what we're left with is a whole bunch of really different options that are fairly unusual compared to, I don't know, your standard uh, you know, choral harmonies that you might right. get a score of the same song. Um, and so it was it was that sort of tour and then the transformation after that that sort of led us in that direction and really was pretty different um, between where we were as a as a trio because we were as a, as a trio, they were doing a lot of things that already had set parts, you know, these these um, pieces that we had learned from Village Harmony. We had been taught what the parts were. And so yeah. we learned the parts and sang them. Yeah, so you, you, so I mean, one of the things that you're that that is implicated in that process is moving from learning these things um, very directly to listening to what everybody else is doing and responding to it in the moment. Um, and that that process of, of of listening and singing at the same time, I think, is is a is a skill that really needs to be learned and something that you guys have become masters at. But how? How was that at first? I mean, it, it seems like it's just so hard, <laughs> you know? Well, it's it's definitely a process. And we we do a lot of, I mean, as Jeremy mentioned, we do a lot of recording of our rehearsals. So uh, 
it's it's listening to each other in the moment, but also going back and saying like, oh, three times ago, you sang a really cool note on this word. Like, let's go back and find what that is. And sort of, we, we do a lot of shaping of our arrangements around the text. And it's not just like, oh, here are, here's a line that works well and let's sing it on every verse. But we, but both because we come up with lots of um, chords that we like, but also because we really want to be doing that storytelling with our music. Um, the it's it's a long process of of experimentation, listening, refining, so that by the time we put something on stage, it actually is quite um, quite refined and quite consistent. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, it, it, with the big exception of singing Corsican music, mostly what we put on stage is um, is not improvised in the moment of the concert. Mm -hmm. um, Corsican music being the exception because that's a tradition that is a lot about um, improvisation and we could talk a whole hour about, about right. Corsican singing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely been a, a, a learned process and one that I think we are still, still learning, you know, like some arrangements happen really quickly. Sometimes we get through a whole song and in, in a day or a weekend, and sometimes we have to like put a song to bed for a few months and then come back to it, uh, with sort of fresh eyes because we just get stuck in a loop or can't, can't figure out where we want to go with it. So it's, it's not, um, you know, progress in life isn't, isn't linear. So it's the same right. is true of our, our work with songs. But I think as a group, we are, we are constantly maturing and learning each other. And just having been singing together for so many years means that we have a really intuitive sense of, of what Windborne as a group sounds like, you know, there's, it's, and, and the thing, I mean, cause like, uh, you know, Will's a composer, Lynn and Jeremy have also done some, some writing and arrangement of their own. Um, but nothing that any one of us could write sounds like Windborne the way a, a piece that we put our four brains on sounds like Windborne. Yeah. So that that's always a really exciting and fun and um, sometimes stressful, but always rewarding process of, of discovering what each song is going to become. Very cool. So speaking of these songs, so you, um, you know, we've mentioned that you perform other music that's not American, but you also perform a lot of songs uh, that that are American. And you've you've sort of moved, I think it would be fair to say, from a more of a, a grab bag approach in the in that in the State Department days to thinking about the songs in terms of themes and in terms of what um, in particular this idea of um, uh, the topical within traditional song. Um, so, so talk a little bit about that evolution of your repertoire. I think it really started in a way um, in in 2016, in the in the beginning of 2016, um, or maybe even a little bit into 2015. We our first song that we said, oh, we're going to do something political, was a uh, a campaign song for Bernie Sanders very unofficial campaign song. Um, and, you know, we we hadn't really talked about politics as a group very much uh, in, in my memory. Um, it wasn't something that, you know, we discussed really. And as, you know, I think the country and, and certainly our peer group and generation started talking more about things like income inequality, you know, it was, it was a few years after uh, Occupy at this point, but but those those terms were firmly uh, in the public discourse in in a major way. Um, we did start just talking about that a little bit and discovered that you know all of us shared uh, similar similar political alignment in a lot of ways. And I think you know over the course of singing these songs and learning these histories and engaging with these topics, it's actually perhaps become a little bit more similar um, to each other as 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 we've learned about some of this stuff together, but um, it, it took us a while to, to, to say like, oh, do we want to quote unquote be political as, as a group? And um, the, the uh, give Bernie Sanders your vote was the, was the first one. It was a, a parody <laughs> song to uh, a bluegrass gospel uh, harmony piece called Give Me Just a Little More Time. And um, shortly after that, I rediscovered a uh, or sort of I don't know if I we call it rediscovered I I remembered this this album that I listened to a lot during college uh, that was um, called English Rebel Songs by the group Chumbawamba who everyone yeah. knows 
uh, by the, the song Tub Thumping, the I right. get knocked down, but I get up again. Right. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, they had this amazing album of, of acapella protest folk from, from the UK, historical songs. And there's a couple pieces on that that, you know, we, we listened to them as a group. We listened to the whole album as a group. And there's a couple that jumped out, out at us. Um, I think initially it was really a, a piece called Song on the Times. And then another one, uh, we, what was the other one that we did right off the bat? Chartist. The Diggers song. Oh, and the mm, Chartist yeah. anthem. And, and then Chartist was a little yeah. later. Yeah, right. Because yeah. Will, Will did a, some arranging for that. And so we, we, we looked at these songs and it just felt like these are discourses that are happening in our present day. And how can we, you know, use these songs that are 100 or 400 years old, um, but feel like they were written, you know, in 2016. And we started singing those and the response from audiences was really powerful. And, you know, it went from people always would come up to us after concerts and say, wow, this is such beautiful music. I love your harmonies. This is really great. But then they were starting to come up to us and say, like, this is uplifting. This gives me hope. This like makes this is like what we need. This like gives me the strength to keep keep fighting for these for these uh, important issues. And that that I think had a, a powerful effect on us. And um, you know, we we came up with this idea for an album of all songs from past movements. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what turned into the the book and and CD of of Song on the Times. But it, it really, you know, it developed our uh, awareness of these issues as a band, and it became re really clear that, you know, this connection between folk music and and progressive uh, social action has been a long-standing one, and certainly one that we feel aligned with. And I'm glad that we sort of made that switch and 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 aligned ourselves in that direction. Yeah, so it's, it's a it's a wonderful album and 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 book as well, um, and just amazing to have uh, that kind of history of topical song within the within the folk tradition um, is is very a very neat project, um, and it it to a certain extent that that uh, worked into your uh, your work with the archive challenge as well. So let's talk about your participation in the American Folk Life Center's archive challenge. So how did you how how were you initially contacted by uh, by the the archive to to work on uh, uh, a song from from our archive? Yeah, the, the initial the initial contact was we were going to FAI the Folk Alliance International, and um, we got an email I think along with all of the other official showcase artists asking us if we would be interested in participating. Um, and we we liked the idea. I mean, you know, finding old songs and putting them in our style and and updating or adapting them is really the core of what we do. So we're like, oh, this fits entirely. Um, and we started sort of looking through these archives. And I'm going to pass it over to Lynn because I think that that's maybe the person to tell the story <laughs> of how we actually found and and adapted this song in particular. Um, well, I think Will and I were doing some listening you know, like late at night in our room, like we do, <laughs> um, just because that's such a long process, you know, just listening to so many songs and trying to find something. It's, it's a really interesting process that Windborn goes through, not just with the archive challenge, but in general of sort of listening to a song and imagining what it could be, even though that's not what you're actually mm -hmm. listening. <laughs> there has to be something in it that grabs us, you know, ideally both in the lyrics and in the melody, both. Um, although we have been known to, you know, completely, like Jeremy mentioned earlier, you know, do parodies, completely rewrite songs if we really like the, um, the melody. Um, but we really wanted to find something that, that spoke to us in some way. And I mean, we came up with one, we, we heard Lily Steele mm -hmm. singing the sard song of hard times. And I mean, go listen to her voice, right? It's just, just like, ah, oh, she just grabs you right off the bat. So I think instantly we were you know a little bit like paying attention suddenly when we heard that one because there's a lot of like listening to something definitely not listening to something definitely not <laughs> listening to something a little bit longer i mean maybe that could go somewhere i don't know listening to something and that one just instantly that voice whether or not we were going to consider it we had to listen to it right huh, right it's amazing and 
because I think we had already been thinking along these lines of, of sort of protest music and songs with a bit of a social message, I think we were already primed to hear some of that. Um, and so when we heard this one, which is this really biting kind of ironic social commentary complaining about, you know, so-and-so is cheating so-and-so and oh gosh, everyone's cheating everyone. And boy, it's hard times because everyone's cheating everybody else. And it was a little bit unclear even whether the message of the song was people were cheating because it was hard times or the fact that people were cheating was making it hard times. Maybe, maybe some of both. Um, but I mean, in the song itself, the melody was, was really, a little bit unusual and, and lilting. And of course the way she sung, but I mean, we instantly just, we knew that this was probably the one. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, remember we didn't, we sent that one to the other two and, and I don't even think we sent them other options at first. We said, well, we have some other options, I think, but like, this is really, this is the one that we want to work on. And I think even before I heard their response, I started learning the melody because I was just so taken with it. Um, I remember I think at a certain point when we had decided, yes, we will definitely work on this one. This is the one. Um, there was a long car ride to a gig, you know, that's as, as is, you know, the other half of what we do for a living is drive. Right. What I actually do. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're in the car and I was just listening to the song on loop, trying to learn, learn the melody. And I, I think I started out by really trying to very, very closely mimic her inflections to really get a, a good sense of what she did with it. Um, because it wasn't even obvious at first, even where the meter was. I mean, because she's singing it unaccompanied and it's this field recording, the scratchy recording. And, and of course it, I think it starts even partway through. She hasn't, right. it's not even like a, here we go. And it's, she's sort of in the middle of it in the middle of a phrase. And so I was even just trying to get a sense of what is the meter of this song? What is the melody of this song? What, what's variation versus melody and what's meter versus trying to squeeze in words? One of the verses, it's really funny. She sort of fits in a whole bunch of, a whole string of words. <laughs> yeah. She sort of, it's one verse where she kind of goes, here's the old baker bakes all the bread we need. <laughs> yeah. and I, I wondered if she was like trying to think of what the words were and then sort of caught up and anyway, but it was really lovely. And so I started out really imitating her until I felt like I really knew it and really learned it. And then after that, it became a process of, I don't want to just be imitating her and finding my own voice in it. And so then I think by the time I came to the group, I sort of had my own way of singing it, which was definitely inspired by her lilt, but was trying to also find my own voice in it. Um, and then we did our usual process of, of sort of everyone trying out different things and different harmonies. Um, and we talked about sort of the message of the song and picked out the verses that we really, really like and that spoke to us. And then sort of, I think maybe it was Jeremy who had the concept of, of how the we could take it further, how, how we, we could sort of say, OK, yeah, there's people in town who are cheating each other. But what if what why? Why, why are, are things hard right. for them? Why are they cheating and who cheated them? And OK, so there's the power. So maybe this person actually was in power and cheated that person. And that's why they cheated here. But what about this person? Maybe they were feeling feeling tight because they were being cheated by this person and then tracing the lines of power up, um, which is how we end with our verse about it all being the billionaire who's really pulling the strings. Yeah, um, it's re it's really interesting, because if you look at that song sort of historically, um, it, we have lots of broadsides in it, which I, I, I sent you guys at the time that you were working on this arrangement. But it, there's like, you know, there's versions of it with like 50 verses where every single middle class occupation is involved in this cheating. But right, it, it's it's the whole divide and conquer thing, right? What the song is, it's turning people against each other who don't ne shouldn't necessarily be the people to blame for this situation. So your thinking on that was... I think, you know, kind of revolutionary in terms of looking at that song in, in a new way. And I think that's one of the cool things that uh, that have, that came out of that project is, yeah, why should all these people be fighting with each other? They, they're they all victims of the same thing, ultimately, um, economically. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a, a great new way to look at that song. It was so, like reading, reading between the lines. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah something that was, course, it's never, never there in the broadsides, but it's, yeah, so... Yeah. Yeah. So. And of course, we'll, we'll send you this, but I just wanted to very vaguely show you. Yeah. This is our uh, illustration for that. Oh, cool. I show this. So we, we have, you know, over over here, we have the baker in the bake shop. 
mm-hmm. uh, who's in, in who's being dragged along by the banker, right. who's being held by the politician, who's then controlled over here by the uh, sort of invisible hand of yeah <laughs> of the billionaire. <laughs> Very cool. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and that now is what you were showing me actually is part of, is your is your next project, your upcoming um, album. So. Talk a little bit about that. What else is on there besides this great um, uh, arrangement of hard times that you put together? Yeah, the the album is called Of Hard Times and Harmony. So it takes the title track um, or, or it takes the title from inspired by the song of hard times. And it's sort of a follow on to um, our, our previous book and album, Song on the Times, and that it is another collection of songs that all sort of point at um, social issues that we see happening around us. Um, and so it's got uh, it's got a, a, a sort of wide range of issues addressed on it. There's a couple of songs that talk about environmental issues. There's a song that talks about um, settler coloniali- colonialism and um, Native American rights. Um, and uh, a song that represents, or that, that speaks to the queer movement um, mm. and, and then but it, as a as an album, it has a much more sort of reflective theme. Um, song on the Times being a lot of labor songs um, sort of felt like songs that are all pointing the finger at an external source mm-hmm. um, and saying, you know, like we workers need to band together um, or, or, you know, we we people of a, of a certain group need to band together uh, to resist this external power, um, which is, you know, a, a great source of, of music and, and message. And then in the past several years, um, as we've been singing those songs and, and looking for more material, it's we, we've been thinking a lot more about our place as as white middle class people in the United mm-hmm. States and and trying to strike this balance between, um, you know, calling out the the uh, the things that we don't have c- control over and the and and pointing the finger at the corporations and the politicians that that do need to be called out, but also recognizing the things that that we as as white folks um, need to be reflecting on and and changing within ourselves and within our own communities. Um, and so that's it's it's a it's an album that sort of tries to strike the balance between those two things and and not um, you know not not point too much in it. It's everyone's just responsibilities and individual, but also not deflect it to being like, well, it's, it's not my, it's not my responsibility because I'm not a corporation. Um, and right. we're, we're trying to sort of thread that needle with this. And, um, it's yeah, like, like song on the times, it's a CD that comes inside a book and it has a lot of, a lot of writing. Um, <laughs> we wrote, uh, essays to go with every song, um, to talk about some of the issues that, uh, you know, need explaining beyond just here are the lyrics. Um, and it's it's really been a labor of love over the past couple of years. Um, and as I think uh, Lynn said at the beginning, it's it's on its way to us now. Uh, Excellent. We, we don't quite have it yet to, to send out into the world, but it's it's very close. All right, well, people can can follow you on social media, find your website, and I'm sure they will find out when it's uh, when it is available. And I think everyone should be looking forward to it. It sounds like a great project. Um, something else that's happened recently that uh, I know you've been dealing with, which is uh, which, which is a, a kind of interesting phenomenon of the pandemic was your TikTok experience. Uh, <laughs> does someone want to address that and explain um, how you went viral and what it's meant for you? Jeremy? Yeah, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll talk about that. Um... TikTok was something that we we sort of have been aware of for uh, a number of years before we really did much on it. Um, I think the first experience that we ever had with TikTok was uh, we had, I, I don't remember how, but I, I downloaded it on my phone and made like one video and that was, it just sort of sat there with just like one video. And that day we were doing a, a residency at a school in, in Massachusetts. And we had reached the end of, you know, a couple of days spent with, with the students and we had been teaching them a song and there's a big concert in the evening. Um, so this is 2019, I guess. And we were saying, yeah, it's been a great time working with all of you. Um, if you want to uh, be in touch, you can, you know, you can send us an email. Your teachers will have that. We're also on Facebook and, and Instagram and TikTok. 
And one of them went, you're on TikTok. And then we got a standing round of applause. From... <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was like a little bit of something that said, oh, like there, this, is, this is a platform that younger audiences are on. Um, and as, it, as I hope it's sort of clear in like in the aspects of, you know, even in putting together this book, uh, we did a ton of writing because education around these around these issues, around this music, around the cultures that different songs come from, about the different ways that that music and and the voice is used. Um, that sort of education part is is really vital to what Winborn thinks of, kind of as our mission. Um, you know, it's it's definitely making good music, but it's also sharing uh, ideas with people and and sharing knowledge with people. Um, and so reaching, you know, reaching new audiences is an important thing. And we got re-inspired during the pandemic because of this whole uh, sea shanty craze mm -hmm. that, that swept through uh, about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago now. And we, you know, we put up some of our music and it did surprisingly well. One of the interesting things about TikTok is that you don't need a pre-existing audience in order for your videos to get uh, viewed. It shows it to people because it thinks, oh, maybe they'll like it. And um, so we started getting a little bit of traction. And then we put up this video of us singing a, a Corsican setting of the Stabat Mater text uh, that we'd shot right before pandemic. We were in France. We were in Mont Saint-Michel um, mm -hmm. in Normandy. And we were in this just amazing room in the refectory um, that had this incredible resonance. And we were there with my younger sister, and I basically handed off the camera to her and said, "Tasha, walk walk around me or walk around us in in a circle." And she, she just sort of like very nicely walked around us in a circle. And there's this beautiful light, amazing reverb, and we put this up. And uh, in the course of about a week, two and a half million people had seen that. And so we were we were a little bit unprepared for it. You know, we we. <laughs> had to then like upload it to all of the social platforms and, and streaming platforms and what have you. Um, and, and really, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of discovery uh, of, of our work through that. Um, and, you know, the, the pandemic has been hard for musicians, uh, yeah. obviously. And one of the, one of the things, you know, aside from just, you know, not having gigs and, and all of that and, and the income side of it, is it just, it's sort of easy to burn out and get a bit discouraged. Um, and I think that that happened with us as well for, for a period of time. And so we, we sort of put a pause on, on TikTok. And in the past month or so, we've started doing a little bit more again. And it'll be really interesting as we um, now are starting to have a few more shows and, and having more public uh, events and, and in-person events. It'll be interesting to see if we can sort of leverage that uh, online presence and see where that goes and in, in person. I just yeah, wanted the, to jump in and say, yeah. oh, sorry. No, go on. Yeah, I just wanted to say one of the things that's been cool about TikTok is that, you know, I think that there's this like sense that like, oh, young people are so disengaged and they don't care about the world. But TikTok has, I mean, and many other sort of aspects of youth activism, but TikTok for us has been a really interesting way to connect with like these like communities of, of, you know, young folks who are on TikTok who are really interested in union organizing or really interested in, in sort of the different kinds of issues that, that we are also passionate about and that we have songs that, that speak to. And so like, we'll put up a song and, and, and someone will be like, I've made it to union talk, or I've made it to, you know, to Corsica talk. And it's, it's been a really, uh, it's been really um, heartening to, to sort of discover those communities and those those niche pockets and and yeah and, and just realize that like yes there are people out there who care not just about the issues but also the care about the music around them because that is like you know <laughs> what we do as well so um yeah and it raises a it raises sort of a thing that we've been thinking about for a while is that for i think certain people the the title of like folk music or traditional music, you know, obviously for some people is really exciting. And for some people, I think they imagine something that is not relevant to them or is boring or is like something that, that they don't want to engage with. And what has been sort of interesting about TikTok is, you know, 
it, it, they don't get a choice of necessarily what they are seeing in their feed. They're just like confronted with the music. And when they just start by being confronted with the music, then people are drawn in in a really powerful way. And they, these are people who would never seek out traditional Corsican polyphony. Like, uh, but it, it sort of gets at this, this core of like, oh, there's something really special about, about harmony, about the voice, about, um, you know, tooting our own horn about what we do. Uh, but all of these things really that um, when people encounter it, it's powerful. And the question is like, how do they encounter it? And how do you get people who don't already know they are excited about uh, Occitan folk music to yeah. listen to that? <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, we, to a certain extent, these these artificial intelligence things that, that watch what we do and figure out how we're thinking are creepy. But on the other hand, like sometimes they will come up with stuff like they they know that we like music that we don't know we like yet. <laughs> you know? And so they show us that. And it's kind of this is kind of the the positive side of of that kind of, you know, experience that people are generally a little bit wary of because, you know, there's also scary aspects to it. But yeah, but there are there are positive things and the sort of algorithm telling you, hey, I think you might like this Occitan song. Well, wow. <laughs> I would never have figured that out. So yeah, so that's great. And um, and you know, we're just delighted that it's provided you with you know just a larger audience for what you're doing because um, you know, that's how these things are supposed to work ideally. And uh, and we we uh, here at the library love what you're doing with with our materials, and we hope you'll engage with us more. Um, I think we're about at the end of our time for this interview. So I would just like to thank you all for uh, being here with us and for participating in the concert series as well as this interview. So I would ask our audiences to please uh, go and look for the concert itself on loc.gov and then use your Google machine to find Winborn and all of their social media um, and engage with them as well. So thank you once again to the members of Winborn. Thanks, Thanks for having us. so much. It's a delight to be here, and uh, we hope to do some more stuff soon again in the future. We hope so, too. Thank you.